said to us, as I believe God is green, very green, <laughs> and I could even add that I think she is deep green. <laughs> Really, where, where the whole book comes from is, is the observation that our deep stories, our mythology, is changing. As that happens, the structures, the systems that we live in, begin to fall apart and accelerate the transition in our stories. One observation that I offer is that our money system itself is just a story. Uh, there's probably three or 400 people here. So let's say we have 300 seats up there and we have 350 people down there, down here. And I say, ready, set, go. And everybody has to get a seat. And if you don't get a seat, you're out of here. Sorry. And let's make it a little bit more interesting. Let's say if you don't get a seat, then you also lose your home. Well, there's probably gonna be a lot of pushing and shoving and elbows. And who's gonna get the seats? The strongest people will get the seats. The fastest people will get the seats and the luckiest. <laughs> but no matter how you organize it, somebody is going to be left out because the rules of the game necessitate that. There are just not enough seats. The economist observes this and says, aha, I understand human nature. It's ruthless to the core. And the biologist stands over here and agrees with the economist and says, yep, they are programmed by their genes, in fact, to maximize reproductive self-interest. So we're going to have to impose civilization onto the human being, morals, ethics. But we know that you really don't want to do that. Like all of that comes out of an observation of human behavior under a very strange set of circumstances. The circumstances of artificial scarcity. Why should money be scarce? Money could be created in unlimited quantities, theoretically. It's just zeros and ones. The reason that it's scarce has to do in large part because of how it's produced, which is as interest-bearing debt. Let's just simplify things and say, I am the bank, or I'm the banking system, and I lend every single person in this room three million. Every single one of you gets three million. And every single one of you owes me six, six million because of interest over 10 years, okay? Everyone has three million, everyone owes me six million. Do you see a problem here? Do you see how this is like that, that game um, of not enough chairs? What happens after 10 years, most of you actually do pay me back six million each. How is that possible? It's because in the interim, I've lent even more money into existence. But that new money comes with even more debt. But that's okay, because by the time that comes due, I will have lent even more money into existence. So the system works as long as it continues to grow. So who do I lend money to? Well, you have to come to me with a good business plan that says I'm going to create things and sell them to everybody else. I'm going to uh, create a coal mine and mine the coal and sell it or a, a strip mine, or I'm gonna um, have a fishing, fishing trawler and catch fish, or maybe I'll find a place where everybody is pretty self-sufficient. Um, and you take away their systems of identity. You take away their sense of self uh, by dismantling their myths, perhaps, uh, which, can, which can happen through very uh, benign seeming activities. Like you build a school there, you build a hospital. You know, what could be wrong with that? until the kids go to school and forget how to take care of the animals, the, the, the forget, you know, no longer learn the, the local skills of self-sufficiency, and, and they disbelieve the local customs and the local stories that say, here's the way that the world works, here's what's important, here's what's valuable, and here's who you are. You remove those things, and you create a cultural void where people are hungry for, well, once their identity has been dismantled, they're hungry for identity. They're hungry for the right sneaker. They're hungry for the right brand. They're hungry for status. They're hungry for power. They're hungry for security, because security in a traditional setting comes from people taking care of each other. And when that is taken away, the substitute that we're offered for that deep kind of security and belongingness is money.
in our system, it sure does seem like we are a bunch of separate competing selves in a world of other, surrounded by competitors. And more for you is less for me. But it's not like that in that little traditional village I described that practices Ubuntu, that understands that more for you is more for me. Because every bit of good fortune that you have will enable you to give more to me, or to give more to the person who gives to the person who gives to the person who gives to me. And then I will give it onward. So this kind of spiritual principle of as I do to the other, so I do to myself, which is really what the golden rule originally meant. It wasn't a rule. You know, if you want to be good, Jesus says, do unto the other as you would do unto yourself. No, it's simply a statement of fact. It's a statement of non-separation because the other isn't really separate. That, that spiritual principle in an Ubuntu society uh, makes economic sense. And this, um, this division of reality into the material and the spiritual has been a poison to the planet because we treat the planet as if it were not sacred, you know, as if it were just a bunch of, self, of, of stuff. Uh, one, one reason that I accepted this invitation to come here um, is because it is um, a faith-based movement, um, at least this part of it is, that is rejecting uh, the kind of uh, desacralization of the planet, of nature, of materiality. It's not only saying, well, we should do a better job taking care of the planet because if we don't, we're going to go extinct. It's not only saying that. It's saying that the planet is sacred in and of its own right. Today, we're running out of room on this planet for growth. That means there's no way out of the crisis unless we change, it, change the system on a much deeper level. Uh, and the level that we have to change it on is we have to bring it into alignment with what I like to call the new and ancient story, uh, a new mythology that no longer sees us as separate from nature, no longer sees nature as a thing, no longer sees us as separate from each other, um, understands that human nature isn't as we've observed it in this ruthless game of each against all. What we need to do is to understand that nature has, um, and everything outside of ourselves, have some of the properties of a self, that we're not separate selves in a universe of other. We are interrelated, interconnected, interdependent, and even interexistent. What we need to do is to expand ourselves to include this planet. Because whether we acknowledge it or not, what is happening to this planet is happening to us. That's what the ecological crisis is showing us. The question that I explored in sacred economics is what would an economic system look like if it embodied the new story? Because our current economic system it creates separation, puts us into competition with each other, casts us into the world of the separate self, and it drives endless growth. In the new story, we are perhaps the co-creative partners of nature. We become members of ecology and not exceptions to ecology, which, mean we, which means we obey the laws of ecology. So money disobeys a fundamental law the law of impermanence. Uh, it seems, and, and everybody on some level knows that you can't take your money with you, that yourself is not your money, but we behave very much as if it were. In my country, it's getting more and more obvious. Uh, the um, depression, the suicide, the anxiety, the addiction, uh, all among the people who have won the rat race, who are at the top. This paradise has turned into a hell. And that is bringing us, along with the ecological crisis, is bringing, bringing us to a state of humility. 
where we no longer, in the guise of development, say, let us tell you how to live. Here, our life is the good life. Our ways are the best ways. Because our ways of knowing are better. Look what we've created. Well, look what we've created. We're, we're coming to doubt that. Um, so I'll just throw that in there as well, that the revolution that we're in goes all the way to that level um, of how we see ourselves and how we see the universe and everything in it. That's how deep it goes. So thank you.